Hello everybody. With this first video, I will begin a series of insights into many topics covered in my book Moving Mountains, which is entirely dedicated to prayer. What does it mean to pray? To pray basically means to communicate with an entity that cannot be assessed through the five senses, namely we think that the world we live in is what we can perceive, evaluate, test through the five senses. That is, we have sight, we have hearing, we have touch, we have smell and we have taste. But we are all instinctively inclined to communicate, to communicate fundamentally, to ask for help, to give thanks, to confide in entities that we know well, because it can be God, it can be Our Lady, it can be a saint, it can be a deceased person, it can be a master assumed. Everybody knows with whom they communicate, so we fundamentally communicate with these entities, knowing that they cannot be assessed through the five senses. Why do we do that? Because if we can't perceive them, if we can't see them, then they don't exist. Are we all crazy or are we not? Praying has characterized, since the beginning of human history on this planet, all the populations that have passed on our planet Earth. So I ask myself, are we all crazy then? If we all instinctively engage in this practice, there must be a physical basis, a scientific principle that can prove it. So this will be the outline of my studies and insights in the book Moving Mountains. How can we explain this phenomenon? Does praying perhaps mean going inside a sacred place, getting down on one's knees in front of a sacred image, which may be a crucifix or it may be a painting, reciting a text that we were perhaps taught when we were children? The answer is yes, because when we perform this act, we communicate with an entity that we cannot perceive through the five senses. But praying is not just that. Because, for example, I have met many people who have confessed to me that they don't believe or practice at all, or that they do not at any rate follow the canons and behavioral channels typical of a religion, but they do practice meditation or who periodically talk to, for example, deceased family members, deceased friends, asking for help, or giving thanks, or confiding their emotions. This, too, is prayer. So, to pray is to communicate with an entity that cannot be assessed through our five senses. But why do we do this? To be able to give an answer, we have to analyse the anatomy of our body. It will seem like an inappropriate sentence, what I have just said. It will seem that I am now going off topic with this statement. What could be the relationship between prayer and a dry description of the anatomy of our body? What could be the relationship between these two topics that are so seemingly distant? You will realize that there is, even within us, a part that can be assessed through the five senses, after which we pass a limit, like a gateway, beyond which other rules apply. So, if I meet a friend, down the road I can stop and talk to him, or I can confide in him, I can ask for help, I can confess my emotions. If I pray, I have in front of me, or better, I'm immersed in an environment 
where I have the perception of being able to talk to an entity that cannot be assessed through our five senses. But our body, as well, is structured largely or entirely by small bricks that we will describe later, which cannot be assessed through the five senses. So, let's start this journey from the initially large, that is, the macroscopic description of our body, to the infinitely small one. So, what do we look like? First of all, we can see that we have a head, we have two shoulders, a chest, two arms, two hands, a belly, two legs and two feet. And that could be the rough description of our physical body. In reality, we have organs that are not visible, that are inside our body, but those who practice surgery, for example, know that they exist. Or if we do a CT scan, an MRI, we can see them. So yes, there are parts of us that are hidden, but they are hidden basically for practical reasons. It's not like I can have my heart in contact with the outside world or my kidneys in contact with the air. It is good that they are inside, because should that happen, we would have serious problems staying alive. However, all our organs, in turn, are structured by tissues. What does it mean, tissues? Tissues are a collection of cells. I remember when I was a medical student, after nine months of studying more or less eight hours a day, we arrived to take the anatomy exam, which was, I think, the most stressful part of the whole course of study. After two hours of questioning, in which more or less three lecturers were slaughtering us, when we got to the end of the exam, we had to, to, we had to look at a tissue through a microscope. What is a tissue? A tissue is a piece of an organ, like a liver, a heart, a kidney, which is prepared with specific dyes that we would then go and look at with the microscope. And we had to work out whether it was a liver, a lung, a kidney, an intestinal epithelium, a piece of skin. With great anxiety, because often, if the test didn't go completely well, if we got the slide wrong, it could mean we had to repeat the test. And that was not a pleasant experience. When we look at the slide, we see a collection of cells. They are all specialized. Why? Because our body is structured by cells. Cells are entities capable of autonomous life, which in the number of 50 trillion or so, structure our entire physical body. They originate from our mother's egg cell, which fertilized by the spermatozoon, is then divided into 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, until it reaches the almost incalculable, almost unaccessible, astounding number of 50 trillion. It is a frightening number. Moreover, these cells are all specialized, or rather ultra-specialized, because our neurons are electrical engineers, electronic engineers, IT engineers. They are experts in electromagnetism. Our liver cells are experts in chemistry. Our kidney cells are experts in filtration systems. Our adipocytes, which I love, on the other hand, are warehouses. They fill up with fat when we eat too much, introduce too many calories, calories, and empty out when we lose weight. So, we have to reason now that by talking about cells, we have already reached a limit in the description of our physical body that cannot be assessed by our five senses, because we need optics to see them. So our sense of sight has reached a limit of blindness. When I go out in the morning and meet a neighbor or a friend of mine, it's not that I can stop to say to her, him, good morning, what beautiful cells you have today. Absolutely not. Why? Because I don't see them. I can say, you look good today. You have a nice dress. I like your new hairstyle. What nice shoes you have. That's because I can assess it. Oh, what a nice perfume. Have you changed your perfume? Is it clear? 
but I can't see the cells. Yet, I wonder, does the fact that I can't see them mean that perhaps they don't exist? Of course they exist, but I need lenses to apply to my eyes. So, nature has already organized the world in such a way that we have a limit beyond which, in principle, we should not go. What we see of the environment in which we are immersed is not reality, because in reality the environment is structured by portions, by parts, by bricks that cannot be assessed by us in the normal tasks of everyday life. Let's go even further. Our cells, in turn, are structured of proteins, fats and sugars. So, in principle, we all know that we eat to replace the substances that make up our bodies. That is, we have to introduce proteins, fats and sugars to replace the molecules that structure our cells. So, let's get this straight. Our physical body is structured by 50 trillion cells, which are, in turn, composed of molecules. The main molecules are proteins, fats and sugars. And molecules, in turn, we go into the smallest detail. How are they formed? Molecules are made up of atoms. So, please understand that we, with our five senses, see more or less a rough anatomy of our physical body. And we think that we are what we see. In reality, if we go further and further into the small, we can learn that by adding optics, we can learn that we are made up of 50 trillion cells. Beyond that, reality shows us that we are structured by molecules which are themselves composed of atoms. And what is an atom? We will learn that an atom is a pure electromagnetic structure. What a difficult word, a pure electromagnetic structure. It means that the atom is basically a building block that makes up our whole physical body. But it also makes up everything around us. The air we breathe, all the water on this planet, all the plants, all the animals, our house, our car, all the planets in the solar system, the whole universe and everything around us. So we are immersed in a world that has atoms as its lowest common denominator. This is a concept that we will have to integrate and make our own because this knowledge can actually change our lives. Why? Because everything around us is structured by bricks called atoms, which will be described in more detail in the next videos, showing that they have such a conformation that we can call them pure electromagnetic structures. Atoms are pure energy. They have very little to do with matter. When we pray, we are basically interacting with them. Therefore, in our lives, we should daily and consciously reason and evaluate that our physical body is structured by bricks which are a part of the whole 
and are fundamentally composed of energy. This is one of the fundamental and main reasons why we pray.